Okay, so we're in our last QGIS tutorial, and this week we're going to cover thematic mapping and creating a cartographic product, a, a final map. Um, we're basically where we left off last time. I sort of cleaned up my layer tree a little bit here. Uh, but we have the base map, we have our 2017 structures, and we have our grid squares. Now you'll have your newly digitized features in there as well. I haven't done that, so I'm just going to use my 2017 structures lines uh, as the example for the thematic things that I'm going to do, uh, displays that I'm going to do for you in the practicum video. Know that you can use that layer, you can use the layer that you created, you can do both of them, um, and obviously when you take this to uh, your own project or another project, you're going to have a different set of data and you can do all of these kinds of things with pretty much any data set you want as long as, you know, I'm showing you specifically here vector themes and uh, as long as there's appropriate attribute data attached to that uh, vector layer um, with at least one column of data that's meaningful, you can create a meaningful thematic map. So without further overview, let's get into it. Um, first thing is that we're just going to talk about how we attach, uh, or we use the numbers in uh, in the table attached to the uh, particular vector layer to affect the style. I said numbers there. Numbers are certainly useful, but also categorical variables, including things like these names, right? These are different categories. They're not like counting up or anything like that. They're discrete. So you have categorical, you even have uh, date time objects here, um, and then you have continuous numerical variables. Some of them are integers, some of them are, you know, have decimal points, um, and you can proceed thematically with any of these data columns as long as the data that are in them is meaningful. So, you know, do I want to th map thematically based on latitude? Maybe, but probably not. Um, do I want to figure out the original use and show that in some sort of color or size? That's probably a little bit more useful, okay? So the first thing you need to do is to know your data attributes and figure out, you know, basically back of the envelope how many kind of categories you think there are going to be and if it, it's going to be an appropriate attribute to create some sort of colorful or symbolic display. So we know our data set. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of how we do this. So I'm just double clicking to get the properties. Again you can right click and go to properties and we're going to work in this symbology tab right here. So We've been working with just this thing called single symbol. I haven't even clicked up here. If we click on that, we actually have multiple um, other ways that we can create the symbology. Let's start with the one just below single sy uh, symbol. We'll go to categorized. Now categorize should give you the clue that you probably need categorical variables. Now you can put continuous variables like numbers in this but it's going to categorize them and every single unique occurrence is going to be a category. So let's start with uh, uh, something that you might do. Um, now your the ones you digitize will have the only numeric column is the uh, condition column. The type column is is categorical by nature but let's say I don't know what I'm doing I pick something like height, which is meters uh, from the ground surface to the top of whatever feature. And I put it in here, and the way you do this is you pick your column variable name, and then you click this classify button, and all of a sudden I see I have all these classes and all these different colors. Well, if I hit apply, and it changes all the colors of the features based on their the height of them, and there are so many different heights here because this is not a categorical variable. This is a continuous variable. So categorize is not the way to go about uh, displaying the wall heights thematically. We're going to cover this in a little bit. We have to pick an appropriate categorical variable. So if I now instead 
go to um, original use, which is your ty analogous to your type column in the in the vector you've been digitizing. We hit classify. It's going to say, hey, do you want to delete the original uh, classes? So we're just going to click yes. Uh, and now we see now there's a good number of these, but it's sort of a little bit more tractable. So we can hit apply, and it will change the colors. Now, you may be wondering where the colors come from. And that's what this thing is right here, color ramp. Um, and then the thicknesses are the thicknesses that we set before. So if we click here on symbol, um, we can configure it and we get basically to the line, simple line. And here we can increase the stroke width. And uh, if we hit apply, everything will get a little thicker. Okay. If we want to change the categories, the colors attached to each category, we're going to click on the color ramp uh, entry point here. Now, it'll show you sort of like the top 10 color ramps that it wants you to use, and you can have fun with those. Here's one called Turbo, which is basically rainbow. So you hit apply, and it basically goes from the top to the bottom. And, you know, if we had ordered categories, you know, let's just say the order was meaningful, then this rainbow ramp might be helpful but ours aren't particularly ordered by anything so the rainbow kind of doesn't make a lot of sense we might want a color ramp whoops to click on this little arrow afterwards that m might be different right so we can see all their color ramps but maybe none of these are what we want because they're all continuous you know so we can create our own color ramp create new color ramp and we don't have to do this from scratch. We can actually tap in to some pre-existing vetted color ramps from Color Brewer, which is the site that I showed uh, linked to you in uh, the last slide of the uh, lecture on Monday. And Color Brewer is great because they've done a lot of color science to help you uh, create meaningful color scales for your for your different types of data, including categorical data. And, you know, you go to colorbrewer.org, I think it's colorbrewer2.org, to get a sense of all of these different color schemes. But once you know, sort of, generally, what these different color schemes are good for, this is a really useful way to choose a more meaningful color scheme than just any kind of default. So I'm just going to pick this set one, because, again, this is non-ordered, and these colors, of the order doesn't matter. They're just sort of picked so that the intensity and the hue and all of that kind of stuff create easy to see meaningful divisions and we'll click OK. And so now I mean we've got four they're sort of all if I hit apply right but we see we've got four colors and they're not particularly ordered the right the way that we would want because we have more than four types of stuff here. So we might want to go in and change the number of colors, I guess it was five colors, to like nine, let's say. And it'll pick for Color Brewer the nine colors, right? We'll click OK, and we still have more categories than, uh, than we have colors. And maybe it's important, all of these are, you know, I cho we originally chose these because they're unique things. But maybe when we're making our thematic map, maybe we don't need to know about all the different types over here. Maybe we want to condense them so that similar features are kind of, kind of um, grouped together. All right. And the way that we do that is we go uh, back up to the top over here where we select a categorize and we go down to merged features. And because we are originally already selected the original use column, it's already selected for us. Um, and what we can do now is to essentially, uh, where is it? Oops. One second. Pause for the cause. My brain is is failing me at the second. So just that, just a minor brain fart. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, the way that you merge these things is actually easier than any of these clicking on stuff that I was trying to do. You simply uh, hold down the control key 
and you click the entries that you think are similar. Okay, so here's an animal enclosure and a barn. I might think that those are similar. So I have both of them selected and then I right click and I get this little menu and I go down to merge categories. And now barn and animal enclosure are actually merged. Look at that. Um, and maybe I want to merge uh, like the, the pig styes and is there anything else in here that are animal related? Anything that's animal related. Um, that looks like it. So I'm going to right click and merge in and now all three of those are merged together. Let's do uh, like a water management. So aqueducts, I'm holding the control down cisterns, fountains, irrigation canals, and wells. That looks about right. So we'll hit right click, merge. Boom. Those are all merged together now. Um, let's do erosion control. So we have check dams, um, terrace walls, and that might be it. So merge. Now let's do farming. So bergamot, bergamot is a citrus grove. They grow a lot in this particular area. So there's one. Uh, let's see rock fence. Uh, what else do we have? Terrace. That's like a flat place to plant things. Uh, merge. All right. Now let's do our rows. We just have the two merge those together uh, so farmhouse other farm building and sheds those are just sort of buildings so let's merge those uh, kitchen olive press processing ovens wine press water mills those are all food processing infrastructure so merge and then we just have other and unidentified and we can merge those together and now we can classify them uh, all again and we should be able to apply and get a better color scheme for us and let's see how many categories do we have one two three four five six seven eight so let's pick eight of those and click OK so now we have uh, eight colors and uh, we don't need this last one here so we'll just hit uh, apply and all our colors are now updated and meaningful okay so that is uh, how we do merging of these categorical features and uh, I need to show you now how we do continuous variables um, so let's go back into here and we'll go to this graduated and now when we pick the variable that we got we can pick all the numerical ones it sort of any text base or any of these other ones it hides from you at this point so let's pick height like we picked before and we have two methods now we have color and we have size so let's just stick with color and we hit classify and by it's got some defaults classes are five and so let's just see what it does right so now we have white to red red getting taller okay that's pretty useful let's say we want more cat uh, categories so we can increase the numbers and we hit apply um, you can always try and reclassify too if, if it's not rendering for you automatically and that's cool we can go in here and uh, oops, always click this little arrow and we can pick a different color ramp we can even go back in and go to color brewer and choose one of these uh, like you know color brewer um, color ramps click OK and hit apply and we can see that color scheme come through that's pretty cool um, we can also, by the way, create our own gradients with different colors that we choose ourselves. So I can go, for example, bright red to um, 
let's just go like bright yellow when I rotate this over somewhere like so and uh, click OK and hit apply and now I have this red to yellow that I created myself it's pretty straightforward you'll get the hang of it um, the mode is equal count so each of these classes they're going to try and put the uh, same number of features into them and that might be the way we want to do it um, but we might want to try some of these other ones including equal interval logarithmic scales uh, natural breaks pretty breaks you can see how this will all kind of change the way things get categorized uh, standard deviation etc and some of these are uh, more or less useful depending on the numbers that you have in your system all right so we'll just go back to equal count uh, it's usually a pretty good one to use and there we have color um, let's do it by size as well and so now it's the line thickness from the thinnest to the thickest and we have eight so let's just reduce that uh, and apply and okay that's something it's maybe a little bit too wide at the widest end so we can go up here and we can make it thinner like so and you know depending on how far we are zoomed in or out it may make more or less sense so let me just zoom in on one little area and you can see zoomed in it makes a little bit more sense than it did zoomed out but for lines and in this particular situation uh, the thickness may not be the best way to do it for these kinds of features because they're kind of mixed features um, and for maybe just what I was doing I think it was overall height it may not be the best let's pick uh, uh, I think I have a width in here and we'll classify that and that might make a little bit more sense because this is actually the width of the, the thickness of the actual walls itself and so maybe that's a more appropriate category to do based on thickness line thickness um, but either way uh, in your the ones that you're digitizing the only numerical data column that you have is uh, is, is the condition and it's actually not a continuous va variable it's basically categorical but you can kind of treat it this way because it has those uh, that numerical attribute uh, to it. Um, so let's go back uh, to our uh, merged um, uh, thematic area and categorized again and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, reclassify all this I'm gonna hit pause so you don't have to watch me and then I'll I'll show you what we can do next okay we're back to where we were before we uh, detoured into the wall height so I've sort of merged all of these things I've picked a nice color brewer color ramp and uh, we're pretty good to go in terms of our thematic color scheme at this particular point so click OK um, at this particular point um, we've got a couple options in terms of creating uh, you know a map that we can take outside of this program and use um, somewhere else the quick and dirty way to make a map is to simply export the view in uh, this, is this map view uh, window and uh, they do give you a few nice decorations to use for that so let's say we really wanted to have a scale bar and a north arrow so we just go to view we go down to decorations and here we are we can add, add the scale bar by clicking enable scale bar we can pick the kind uh, of scale bar we want i'm just going to pick this one called top uh, tick up and i can put it down in the bottom center and i'll just click ok and there's my uh, scale bar down there maybe I want it to be white so I can go back over here and uh, I can change the color by clicking on where it said fill you know I'll just make it white and we'll click OK 
and there we are. Now I'm going to have to change the font as well. If I wanted that to be white, I could change the line thickness, etc. in that same dialog. In the same way, I can go to View, Decorations, North Arrow, Enable North Arrow, and uh, you know by default it's going to give me this guy right here. So let me just uh, make it white so that we can see it and put it in the top left and there she is right up there um, but let's say I don't want that one I can go to decorations north arrow and it says custom SVG uh, if I click on that QGIS ships with a bunch of SVG symbols so if you really want you could pick any of these but there's one called arrows and you can pick a simpler one like so and there we go uh, also in there are, you can put a grid, you can insert an image, you can put a title, copyright, etc, etc, etc. At this point, you know, maybe I'm happy with what I'm looking at. I can adjust my zoom in whatever way that I want. Um, and if I want to change the width, I actually can just drag this guy over or this other side over like so until I'm happy with the width. And I can go to the project menu and uh, let's see where is it it is export import export export map to image and just leave most of the defaults the same hit save and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna call this test map it's gonna save it as PNG but I can pick like JPEG or something like that and I can hit save and at this particular point what I can do is um, go into my folder and find testmap.jpg and there it is I got my scale bar my north arrow and quick and dirty I have a map saved out that is in a graphic form I could open this up in any graphic uh, uh, software and I can do other stuff to it if I wanted to um, it's the quick and easy way to just get an image out of the map view and into an image format. It is not the best way. Obviously, these decorations, you kind of don't have that much control over where they're placed, over what they look like. And, uh, you know, you want, might want to have finer control over the, the scale, and you might want to have some more control over how the map is composed in terms of its balance and proportions and all of that kind of stuff. The good news is that they give you a special tool just to do that. And uh, that tool lives under project and it's layouts. Um, you can do it two ways. You can click the layout manager which gives you this thing and you can create a new layout right here or you can go to project and uh, new print layout and you can give it a quick name so I'll call this project one dash final map right? and we'll open up this whole brand new window this oh man it's had many names over the years uh, print composer print layout uh, cartographic composer etc now it's called the layout manager or something like that. Uh, in any case, this is more like a graphics program now where you can tie in your map data and you can overlay other kinds of graphical elements. So really, if you've ever used any kind of layout software like Adobe InDesign or um, Scribus or Quark or uh, something like that to create things like brochures or posters, this is pretty much the same kind of deal. Um, you get all these kind of tools to move elements around and you can have them be linked and you can have them be filled with content. So the first thing you're going to want to do is to format the page. Uh, and you do that by just right clicking anywhere in this blank canvas and click page property and it shows up over here. Um, Here's where you get to set the size and the orientation of the basically the blank canvas that you are uh, that you are working with. Um, so let's pick a letter, and because our map is pretty vertical, we're going to pick portrait orientation. Now this is useful because I have a, a printer over here that prints U.S. letter size, 
if I wanted to pick something bigger, I could. The, the sort of standard ANSI formats for A3, A4, A3 being like a concert poster size, etc. I could pick those, and I could go down to custom, and I could type it in in any units that I wanted, uh, and I could get um, you know exact dimensions for whatever I wanted to print. Uh, but again, let's just stick with letter for now and portrait orientation because of our map is vertical. If we had a horizontal view, of course, we'd probably pick landscape. At this point, we have our sort of blank canvas, and um, we need to add some content to it. So we have some tools. Um, we're going to get into a bunch of these things. You can get uh, a lot of them from the top menu, but they're duplicated over here on the left. So add item, add map is here, but also you can hover your mouse and it says add map. And this tool lets you just sort of draw a box like so, and by default it's just going to pull in whatever is displayed in the current map view, and it will pull it in at the current scale, zoom scale, uh, that you have set to it over here. So let's get back to the print composer, like so. Um, whoops. Where's my print composer? There we are. And uh, as you move and pan this map, it should eventually, uh, you know, adjust whatever is being displayed here. Um, you'll also see now that I have a new uh, thing in my items list over here, map one. That is this particular map right here. And uh, let me just zoom this full screen. And you can see I have all these properties dialogs. I'll just make it a little bigger so you can see, including the actual zoom scale. And here it's set to 7,011. Okay. Um, firstly, let's just make sure that our map is filling up the right amount of the page that we want it to. Um, you got some tools over here to drag and move things around. Um, this select move item, you can drag your frames around like this and you'll notice if I drag it you might see like little lines popping up here some purple dotted lines and when I get it perfectly centered I get a vertical center line and a horizontal center line and that helps me snap my uh, map into the middle of the page and I'm leaving a little white margin around it because you know, it looks kind of nice all right um, then I have other tools like this one, which is to pan the data around inside that map frame. So I can move this up until that little missing area is gone, and I can get it kind of centered, you know, the way that I want it, like so. And over here, I've got the map scale. I can set this explicitly by typing into it. So let's say I want it to be uh, at this 1 to 7,000 ratio. Now I've got it set specifically to the 1 to 7,000 ratio and I can sort of drag and recenter the way that I want it. And um, what I can do at some point I can lock all the layers and anything I change back over here uh, in the regular QGIS view will not be updated when I, uh, you know, in the in the print composer over here. And what else can I do over here? Well, um, I can add a, you know, grid if I really wanted to. I can modify it and I could set the units. And, uh, you know, if I really wanted to, to overlay my own grid, I could do this. Um, I actually don't want to, so I'm going to disable the grid and go back. I can um, set the position and size very specifically, you know, for this particular element on my f on my canvas. I can draw a color frame around it. I can change the size of it. You can see I have this black box now being drawn around it. I could change this to any color that I wanted to. Uh, so now I've got a red box around it. In this particular case, I don't care, so I'm going to undo it. Um, and, and a few other things if you look through here. Um, you got a bunch of basic properties that you can edit as you move along. So let's talk about the decorations that we can add at this point. Well we have our basic decorations like scale bar 
and here when I do it I can be very precise about where I put it I can drag it and move it around I can put it anywhere I want because it's an independent graphic element I can uh, since I only have one map on this particular map at this moment it's automatically going to pick map one and it's going to uh, link it to there and then I can pick the property I want which let's say I want line and ticks up and I can uh, actually increase the number of ticks so if I want five or six or ten or twelve or a billion ticks I can have as many ticks as I want uh, let's go back to two over here I can put some on the left and some on the right if I wanted to um, and I can set the actual width of it here it's in map units which are mostly going to be meters so let's say I wanted it to, to be a thousand I can do that and maybe I just want to have it be one kilometer. There's 1,000 meters right here. Um, I can make it taller. <laughs> I can change the size of the subdivisions. Uh, I can get very fine in terms of my uh, control uh, over it right here. Um, so this is where I put the label. This is meters. Um, let's say I wanted to change this to kilometers Whoops. I can do it there well that's not a thousand kilometers I have to change this multiplier and I think if I just do yeah a thousand now I'm down here it says one kilometer um, over here I've got uh, you know a, a, a variety of display factors I can change I can pick line style, I can pick dashes and all kinds of other stuff, opacities if I want to make it transparent, uh, and I can obviously I can change the color, in this case I want to make my line white, and I got to do that for each one of these things, like uh, the, the upticks are called divisions, so let's make those white, and uh, let's also click on the font, and uh, let's make it also white so now everything should be pretty good uh, I might want to make my thickness my line thickness a little bit thicker on my scale bar and the same thing for my divisions I can click those up a little bit until I'm happy with it and now when I look at this I have a kind of a nice ish or nicer scale bar right now in this particular case I have one kilometer grid so I probably don't need a scale bar but you know whatever uh, North Arrow it's the same deal click it draw where you want it and then you can pick whichever style you want and you can resize it and shrink it to your heart's content and you can change the color of it and whatever you want you can even pick your own custom SVG if you want now maybe I don't need a scale bar and I don't particularly need a north arrow over here um, but one thing I probably do need is a legend right and uh, I have that over here and again I just drag where I want it and by default whatever I've got selected you know whatever showing is going to show up here so I've got my survey grid 2017 structures lines and my base map over here and by default it's connected again to map one and it says auto update if I uncheck that I have control over what I want to show in the legend I don't care about the survey grid it's pretty self-explanatory I'm gonna click this uh, you know, I highlighted it and I click this little red minus and it's gone Google satellite is not even on this so it's gone the base map is the base map it doesn't need to be in there now I'm talking right now I have just the things that I think are interesting this is the sort of all other it's just a thing that QGIS does I can get rid of that if I want and I have all this stuff and it has the original codes in there but they're kind of uh, you know it's kind of confusing so I can just double click on this and now I can type uh, animal infrastructure and you can see it says animal infrastructure and I can go through this for everything and highlight it and put water infrastructure right and I can do this and it'll update everything as we go along 
Now it's got the name by default, the name of the layer. I can right click on that and click hidden and it goes away. Um, let's, let me just rename this one because it's super long. This is food pro processing. Right? And uh, now I have a list that's starting to look kind of nice and actually meaningful. Um, let's say I wanted to style this a little bit. Let's say I wanted to give it a little bit of a title. Uh, SPV is our uh, acronym for San Pasquale Valley. Um, right, there's my title right there. Um, if I had a long title and I wanted to wrap it, like it's just going to expand over blah, 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 blah. I can pick a specific symbol so I can put in, let's just pick, uh, I don't know, I'll just put in this horizontal bar symbol. And since so where it says wrap text on, I can put the horizontal bar and it will use that as the place to cut the line and wrap it around so that it breaks across two lines. And if I wanted to, I can put horizontal bars multiple times. It will wrap wherever I put the horizontal bar. And I can choose whatever feet, whatever symbol I want for that. Um, but, you know, if I just go with a short snappy title from my, from my legend, that's fine. You don't need that. You can move the symbols from the left to the right if you really wanted them to here as well. You can have it auto resize or you can set the size more specifically down below over here in the position and size tab. I can change the font if I want. I can pick the title font and pick a nice font from my nice list of fonts. Uh, like this serif font might look nice on that. You can change the color of the background and you can change the color of the font. And importantly, you can add columns. So here I'm going to do columns and I'll let it split across the layer so that it will split the internal things across like that. And I'll check this equal column width if I want it to be nicely symmetrical. And, uh, you know, now I got to go deal with some spacing issues. And uh, let me just make it simpler for us to look at. Now go to the spacing terms. And we can give the legend a little bit more title, a little bit more breathing room around it. And uh, space between the symbols. We can give everything here a little bit more breathing room and you can give it a little bit more breathing room horizontally and I can grab this and put it like right down in the bottom I can manually size it if I wanted to like so and uh, column space I can give them nice breathing room between the two columns like so and there we go and if I wanted to I could also uh, you know draw a frame Let's just make a black frame around it if I wanted to. And all kinds of other stuff as well. Now, uh, I have a bunch of other options that I can add in here. I can add shapes. Let's just say how for some reason I want to put an oval in there. I can draw arrows that are multi-line, so two left clicks and then to close it a right click. And uh, I can change the color again. To, to white in this case um, for both the fill and the stroke and now I have a white filled arrow tip and change this to white as well with a arrow line that is uh, as thick as I want it like so and I can r scale and resize this to my heart's content should I want to after I made it, uh, like so. I can insert images. That means like I could put pictures if I wanted to, etc. Um, I can also put in the attribute data table <laughs> if I wanted to. Well, in this case, I have tons of attributes, so it's not a good idea. Or I could add a blank table, and I could, uh, you know, edit the table and put whatever data I wanted to in it. And, you know, format it, etc. And there's my, my nice table that I can put anywhere that I want over here. 
Now I've got some great layout tools now so I can select all of these and I can uh, let's say I wanted to align all of them to their center right boom all aligned to the center right here aligned to their top they're all aligned to the top I can uh, spread them out if I wanted to across the the, the page um, I can oops so let's move that guy back uh, align to the center I can move things around on the page I can raise and lower uh, them below other objects you know basically anything you can do in a graphical com uh, program you can do in this you can group them together you can lock them so you can't edit them etc and if I want to get rid of them I can just hit the delete key or I can right click and cut them if I wanted to and they are gone let's do one last thing that we might want to do which is to add a locator map and it's actually pretty straightforward um, what we're going to do is to add another map and we'll just draw it in somewhere like this and uh, by default if I if I have the same map displayed it's already going to show it at, at whatever scale I have zoomed you know whatever I have displayed in my my regular map um, display but if I uh, click on map one the original map and I go down to where it says overviews I can add that in overview one and oh whoops sorry I need to click on map two and <laughs> click plus overview one map frame one and now I am sh this inset map here is going to be showing a locator for the bigger map over here and if I go back to my scale and I set this pretty big 1 to 100,000 something like that um, maybe we'll go to like 1 to 150,000 just so I can show the whole thing you can see that now I've got a nice locator map and I can put it down in the corner and it shows this sort of pinkish area that is the zoomed in part of my map over here and uh, you know there's some um, you can change the style so it doesn't have to be pink like this you can just be an outline or something like that and you can show the positioning where it shows up uh, above everything can be on top over here blending mode etc so you can style your inset locator map any way you like as well and you can move it around and that's the basics of it there's obviously you can go deeper with this um, at the final point over here you want to save it just saves with your QGZ project file so this is going to be here next time you open that um, and when you want to save it out you can uh, you can export it from uh, here as image as SVG or PDF or they give you little quick buttons over here save it out as a PDF is a pretty simple thing to do uh, so I'll just put it over here and click save and it gives you some dialog you know uh, stuff but just let's just take the defaults for, for what we want to do today and it's exported so let me go to my home folder and find there's my project one final map PDF and here it is um, looking pretty good actually you see you see it's got some nice detail and uh, so sort of showing my map um, I think that's just about it for now um, maybe one last thing I will talk about is how to put labels if you want labels to display uh, we're back in the regular map view and we're going to click from the symbology tab to the label tab and by default there's no labels we can pick single labels and then we can pick whatever variable we want to use as the labels let's just stick with original use I'll just hit apply and um, it might take a little while to display but the labels are there so here they are now these are black so you might want to change the color to white and when you hit apply 
take a sweet time and it will change them to white you've got all kinds of uh, decisions you can make uh, you can format you can do text wrapping you can pick the, the font you can add a buffer around it in, uh, in any color that you want so uh, here you can see I picked red as the buffer um, around the white I mean it's making my eyes bleed but you can do that you can add a drop shadow if you want and you can very carefully um, configure how the drop shadow works you can very specifically figure out how you want them placed next to the features uh, so there's a lot of control you can have over uh, the way the labels appear and as you add them here they will also appear in your print uh, print layout and you may have to play around with the overall thickness of the line and size of the font labels until they show up the way you want them at the scale you're going to export your final map product to but all of that is just sort of a quick back and forth between your uh, symbology and your label in the regular map display of QGIS and then your print composer view in the, the sort of layout uh, print layout view uh, tool that you have at your disposal. Okay, I think that does a, just about does it. Um, like I said, this is our last tutorial using QJS. We're going to switch to Grass starting next week, uh, but I will show you a kind of transition, uh, briefly, you know, like analogous between QJS and Grass features. So be on the lookout for that next time.